Hey guys, welcome to Solo React Talk. Today I'm going to be reacting to Rogel Dawn, Praetorian of Terra, Act 3, uh, made by Boldemort Guide to Warhammer. Um, is Warhammer 40k or is it just Warhammer? Sorry, let me just check here. Yes, Guide to Warhammer. <laughs> Sorry. Um, if you want to check out my previous reactions to uh, Praetorian of Terra, Act 1 and 2, remember the playlist card will be at the top. Just click on it and be able to access them. Okay, uh, last week in Act 2, we were dealing with the invasion of Terra by the um, evil Primox, or should I say the traitorous Primox, the traitorous Primox, uh, Loga, Angron, Conrad, uh, Filgrim, Motarian, Botarabo, Magnus, and their leader, uh, Horus Lubrakau. Um, I'm not sure where the other Primarchs are exactly. I only saw Ag Angron on the planet. I didn't see any of the other Primarchs. I think Horus is on his ship in space. Uh, probably they're, you know, in the vicinity of Terra, uh, the other Primarchs. I'm not sure. And Rogel Dawn um, of the Imperial Fists, Sangunius of the Blood Angels, and Jagatai of the White Scars. Um, are based on the planet they're protecting the imperial city uh, the palace and it's a difficult situation they are outgunned outnumbered the emperor is dealing with his own issues in the webway trying to contain the the chaos demons at bay in that uh, situation there so they can't really help the three primarchs who are defending the palace and the other loyalists um, Primarchs are nowhere to be found. They're been scattered across the galaxy, so they can't come back uh, as fast as possible. And uh, Robute Gilliman is he can't tra traverse space because there's a warp storm in his sector of space, so he can't really get back to Terra as soon as possible. So it's a mess, it's really a mess. The three Primarchs with their Astartes legions and uh, the Imperial Guard are trying their best to protect the capital city and you know protect the Imperial Palace and It's a difficult situation um, Yeah, let's continue on with act three three two one go Welcome, gentle listener. I will assume you have watched the first two acts in this, my report on Rogal Dawn. If you have not, then I would gently encourage you to do so. But let us now continue with this tale. The tale of the Primarch of the Seventh Legion, the Legionis Astartes, the Praetorian of Terra. Rogel Dawn. It was soon after that that the forces of chaos discerned something. The one thing they had dreaded more than anything else. The wolf, Lehman Ross, the lion, himself, L. Johnson, and Gulliman, who commanded the largest legion were finally, finally arriving. Their ruse was up, their time had elapsed, their war was over. With these forces arriving, the battle would soon shift in the favour of the Loyalists, and the traitors could well be crushed like so many sour grapes beneath the feet of the righteous. But those on Terra were woefully unaware of this. Horus kept their long-range orspec scanners blind. The forces of chaos, those dark guards who had set this catastrophe in motion to slay their enemy, the one man they called the Anathema, the Emperor of Mankind. They surrounded Terra with such psychic force that even the Master of Mankind could not pierce their obfuscations and discern the impending return of his mighty sons and illusions. 
Okay, so the uh, the Chaos Gods and uh, Horus uh, made sure that um, the forces, the Loyalist forces, can't detect. You know, they don't have the long range communications or sensors to detect uh, the uh, the the backup from uh, Lion L Johnson and Gilliman and Lehman Russ. Uh, you know to return that they're returning back to Terra so they didn't know that this was happening it was only Horus and the uh, chaos gods who realized that time was up for them and you know uh, this invasion plan is not really going out as they foresaw if I can say that yeah okay interesting Horus had no choice he made one last desperate toss of the dice he challenged the Emperor. How did he do so from his flagship in high orbit, one might ask? Very simple, gentle listener. He dropped the shields that prevented the Royalists from teleporting up to his very decks. He made this move blatantly, so it could not possibly be missed by Rogel and his father, the Emperor. This is Horus's battleship? Wow, it's amazing. It's really amazing. Um, what gets to me the most uh, is the fortress on top of the ship. Like you see the ship, right? And then there's the palace or a fortress right on top of it. That's crazy. Yeah, it's over the top. Again, the die was cast. The emperor retreated from his war in the webway and asked his oldest comrade, Malkador, to take his place on the golden throne. It was decided. The Emperor would take the field personally and end this insurrection the only way it could ever be done, by taking the head of the great betrayer with his own hand. Rogel and Sanguinius marshaled the greatest of their warriors and the Emperor would take a selection of his custodian guard. They prepared to teleport themselves directly to the bridge of the flagship of the traitor to appear on the bridge of the vengeful spirit. Rogel must have felt an itch in the back of his mind, a feeling of something amiss. He knew that something was wrong, for he was a Primarch. His father was present for one of the few times he had seen him in years due to his labours in the webway the warp so he felt confident. But something was amiss. The angel moved differently, his bearing too somber for one such as he, as if he were already resigned to something, his smile too warm, as if to say. But there was no time for analysis now. They were to assail the dragon in his lair. The forces of the Emperor strode to their teleportarum and amassed for the assault. Rogel and his hand-picked Terminator guard, heavily armoured beyond even that of a normal set of power armour of the Space Marines, appeared. But the shock of the translation into the very depths of the vengeful spirit was thrice fold and ghastly beyond my vocabulary to describe. The walls of the vengeful spirit were festooned with eyes and mouths that screamed endless cacophonies of blasphemy, of hate and pain. It was a vision of perdition made manifest where all was degradation and twisted nightmare. Any normal mortal's mind would have shattered, and they would have ripped out their own eyes from the horror they were subjected to just by viewing this infernal scene. Rogel saw the future of the galaxy if Horus and his dark puppet masters won out. If there was ever vindication for his struggles, he had it now a plenty. But that was only the first initial reaction, no matter how deep it struck him. His shock was terrible when he realized that the teleportation had been disrupted, for he could not see a single custodian guard. 
He could not see the Emperor anywhere. Nor could he see a sign of his brother Sanguinius, nor his own personal guard. They had been separated. Dawn, the warrior within this man, was calm, and got immediately to the work, as they were almost immediately assailed by endless throngs of perversions, and traitors that were twisted beyond parody. But with a feeling that must have been akin to rising panic, Rogel knew that his force had arrived at the very furthest point from the bridge. He would have to fight his way the entire length of this vessel to reach the bridge, and potentially his brother and father. They were beset on all sides, and would have to wade through terror upon terror, abominations without count. Alas, as one of the largest vessels ever wrought by human hand, the ship was some twenty kilometers long. Rogel did the only thing he could. Twenty kilometers? Wow, okay, that's that's quite impressive for a ship. I mean, let me just say this, the Reapers from Mass Effect are about one kilometer tall, if I'm not mistaken. And those things are huge. You know, one kilometer tall is already big. Now 20 kilometers. This is crazy. <laughs> this is like Star Wars level of battleships, I think. Yeah, that's crazy. Good. I moved with the speed of a god as he began the longest journey of his life. The battle to the bridge of the ventral spirit. His projectile weapon soon ran out of ammunition, and soon he and his guards advanced, fighting every inch of the way to the bridge. Miles. But he never tired. Never let a moment pause where his mighty arm was not raised to swing and slice with his trusted blade. As the seconds became minutes, the minutes became hours. The wake of blood and viscera from he and his men was without measure. The salt of twisted scum never ending. But then, something changed. Oh, how it changed. The very walls of the ship changed the pitch of their cacophony and went from shouting blasphemies to a never-ending wail of lament. The figures who had beset them now fled and ran, screaming in terror and woe. Rogel, despite his fatigue, must have given in turn a bellow of victory. For only one thing could have changed the passages and their denizens so. The Emperor must have done it. His father must have slain Horus. The War Master was bested. The dream would rise like a phoenix, and the world would be well and right again. They had won. with a fleetness of foot that can only be attributed to joy. The way now clear, Rogel charged to the head of the ship to embrace his father and his brother. Joy. All of his efforts had not been in vain. The years, the young men and women in their millions and billions he had sent to their deaths against this outrage. The toil of an entire race had been worthwhile. Humanity had gazed into the very pit, the dark gods of the warp, of the worst that could ever be thrown at them, and had spat into evil's eye. A new dawn was about to begin. They had won. Okay, I really thought that maybe Rogel Dawn would have had like a contributing factor to the defeat of uh horus lubricow yes i thought you know he was going to be there but i guess the emperor just stole the thunder just like that i mean i'm happy i guess i i just want rogaldon to be the one to do it because you know the story has been centered around him for so long so yeah
I, I don't know maybe it's just boulder mode's type of editing his videos but the way the music always goes down like silent and then you hear nothing and then it flips over to the next scene it i don't know i Sometimes I feel like, okay, it's reassuring, you know, victorious. Next thing, it sounds like, no, it's very ominous. It's very worrying, you know. So, I'm not sure. Doesn't look like it's a happy ending. And so, gentle listener, we arrive at the moment. What I call... The longest second. One must remember that a Primarch, any Primarch, is a being of magnitude greater than the normal human. They had faculties almost beyond the scope of human understanding, could discern things that would be impossible for a normal mortal to discern. Sherlock Holmes or Poirot could take hours of meticulous study and dissection of a situation before coming to the conclusions that a Primarch could glean in a second. And thus, with this explanation done, let us progress to the moment I have been avoiding for stalling. It is almost too difficult to narrate no matter how many times I have tried to do so clearly. Let us see the longest second. I will now show you a picture that any Warhammer enthusiast, in fact, most people, will have seen in their lives, but never truly understood. For everyone thinks that they are looking into the bridge of the vengeful spirit, it is merely a painting, a description, but it is not. It is the heart of Warhammer, its soul. For what is shown is what Rogal Dawn was confronted with. So harsh, so terrible. For Rogal tore back the bulkhead and was confronted with it. And in that one second, the longest second, the part of this being, the man called Rogu. Um, sorry, uh, I've seen this image before uh, on the Templin Institute. Um, I think that's Sanguinius on the floor, dead. Horus with his super glove armor kind of you know encasing him and then the emperor kneeling on the floor I, i've never understood this image but i've seen this image before so i guess this is something that baldemar is going to explain to us died. he died the worst way a man can ever die he died of a broken heart The image you see contains the figures of Horus, the Emperor, and Sanguinius. You may initially think that this cannot be, as the figures are standing and the Emperor seems to be about to confront his son, Horus. But give me your ear, and let me explain my reading of the content. For Rogel, Dawn knew the fighting style, the capabilities and failings, the strengths and weaknesses of each individual therein contained. His Primarch mind took it all in, compromised it all, in just one second. The wounds on each, the scars, the scuffs on the floor, the blasts on the walls. It painted a picture that a mere human cannot fathom. In that instant, Rogel not only saw the result of the confrontation, he would have played out every last swing of sword, every last gasp and grapple, every last action that had taken place in that room. He would know what happened 
when, between whom, and how. In the longest second, Rogel saw it all. And it was the end of Rogel. Why? Because he had seen it. The end. He had seen his most beloved brother toyed with, his valor and the mild injury he dealt to a being, his own brother, Horus, magnified by the power of chaos. He saw Sanguinius arrive early. He saw Sanguinius arrive alone. He saw Sanguinius' fury and desperate battle, how Horus had disbalmed him with a backward swing, and then taken his gloved hand and raised him up, crushing Sanguinius's windpipe and snapping his neck. Then his nonchalant tossing of the body of the angel onto the ground, like a refuse. He would have seen the Emperor, then enter the room, would have known that words were exchanged. A plea from father to son to end this path, to return to him, that all could be forgiven. He would have predicted the sneer from Horus, and offer spat back in his father's face. The clash of arms, the battle begun. He would have known the Emperor could not unleash his power, his full skill on this, his most beloved, his first found son, Horus. He would have known, seen even, how Horus had played on this and pressed the advantage, how Horus had fought and then ground the Emperor down, forever thinking he was actually the greater being. So much had the dark powers whispered promises of invulnerability and then heady platitudes into his ears. Horus actually thought he was toying with his father, whereas the Emperor was held back out of love. Yes, even the Emperor was capable of that. How Horus then cut off his arm, how Horus blasted his father with infernal powers and burst one of his eyes and seared the skin from his sire's face. How he took him and raised what he thought was a defeated carcass over his head and brought it down, breaking the Emperor's back. Rogel would have seen another figure, a voyeur witnessing the struggle of gods and how he interceded and stood before the Emperor's carcass. How Horus had laughed and destroyed that brave soul who stood before a god to defend his liege. And in that instant, Rogel would know how the Emperor, the father, would see that there was nothing left of his son to save and how he then marshalled his power and unleashed it. Horus was near destroyed. But, like a vampire of legend, the blow had forced the evil from him, and his face returned to that which Rogel knew. His big brother, Lupukal, was gone, and only Horus remained again. Rogel would notice the tear trails on the face of Horus, and knew the regret as the scales were removed from his eyes and he had seen the horror he had caused, the billions dead, his father broken, his brother dead by his hand. How Horus would have howled in pain. And Rogel would know that the father would then have shown a kind of mercy, knowing full well 
that Horus could turn again at any second and become a vessel and vassal of the Dark Gods once more. But also, because he knew Horus so well, the Emperor knew him. The father knew that the son would never be able to forgive himself for the tyranny and pain he had brought to the world. So, as an act of prevention, yes. But more a last action of love. The Emperor again marshaled the last of his power and destroyed every last trace of the soul of Horus. Nothing would ever remain to be used again. Horus, his greatest and most loved son, was destroyed so thoroughly that nothing could ever be done to return him to plague the galaxy. Nor to feel the weight but the pain of his actions ever again. Whew. Wow. Uh, wow. I... I don't know what to say, really. I really don't know what to say. Um, Rogaldorn... He just came into the into the bridge and he analyzed the situation and he just replaying the entire scene all in his head about you know what happened with Sanguinius and then the Emperor. Um, I'm actually quite surprised that the Emperor tried to beg um, Horus to 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 stop this. You know, come back, come back and be my son again. Um, I mean, after killing Sanguinius, I think from there he should know that this is not my son anymore. This is something else. Uh, but yes, the story about the human or the, the soldier who went into the defense of the emperor when, you know, when he was down and uh, this human soldier sacrificed his life protecting the emperor. I remember that story from... Um, uh, the Templin Institute uh, when they were talking about the Astra Militarum and that they have this folklore that uh, one of their guard members uh, protected the Emperor when uh, Horus Libraka was about to unleash the killing blow on the Emperor and uh, Horus was laughing as uh, Baldemont was saying and then he eviscerated that human being and from then on, that's when the Emperor realized that this is not my son anymore. Um, but I'm saying that he should have realized that when Sanguinius was killed by him. And he, you know, he threw him out like a, like a black bag, you know, holding trash or something. So it's quite surprising that only when this human soldier died, that's when the Emperor finally took the courage or mustered the courage to, you know, erase... Um, Horus Lupercrow's existence uh, from the universe. So yeah, it's quite interesting. And now I know why um, Rogaldorn was not there uh, to uh, defeat Horus Lupercrow because, you know, he was at the opposite end of a 20 kilometer ship. And by the time he got to the bridge, everything was already done. Everything was too late. You know, everybody was either dead or dying. So, yeah, it's unfortunate. Worse still for Rogel. Horus must have returned to the state of being that Rogel would have remembered so well. Would know the evil he was by the travesty of his armor and the surroundings and company he kept. But in that instant, Rogel would have gazed at Horus the Horus he remembered, the uncorruptible titan of hope and justice. But with no even hint of his soul remaining. Such a cruel vision. For now he could not be elated at the destruction of a twisted foe. He would have to mourn all over again the loss of his closest and respected big brother all over again. Yet still there is more. I have stated before that from my reading of the lore that Rogel believed 
He believed in the crusade and the emperor and the imperium. He believed that his father had no choice in his action, and that the only way to save humanity was for him to take control directly, despite knowing he was revealing himself to the dark powers of the warp, and that they would never tire from their quest to destroy him. For they wished humanity be their plaything, and banquet for all time in perpetuity. Rugal believed more than any Primarch, but in this room, he knew the Imperium died. For if any of the three people who were destroyed had lived, the dream of the Imperium could continue and be healed. The Emperor was its king, its architect and protector. Horus was its greatest warrior and held the dream sacrosanct before his corruption, and truly understood the dream, and how to fight for it, and what it was for, the salvation of humanity. And Sanguinius? He was its very soul. He exemplified all that was best and brightest in humanity. He was the shining promise of the future. Sanguinius was the Imperium. He was the goal, so that one day all humans everywhere across the galaxy and beyond could be as he. Sanguinius was a promise made manifest. It was a result of the Crusade and the Imperium. Only Conrad was not present. Horus was to win the Imperium. Rogel was to build the Imperium. Sanguinius was to be the Imperium, and Conrad Curse was to protect it and enforce its law. But Conrad could not match the power of the darkness within him, the darkness that was the Night Haunter, and he had fallen so long ago that Rogel had forgotten. But now he was reminded. But without them, without its philosopher general, Without its soul, without its king, the dream was lost. Rugal could not do it alone. Rugal also knew, all in this one second, that without the Imperium, his race was doomed. It would not be immediate, but it was now inevitable. He witnessed not only the death of his father, his brother and his hope, his dream and his reason to continue. Rogel saw the very future of humanity, its death, all in this one second, the longest second in fiction. The longest second any human had ever experienced, or ever will. But it still continues. The torture for Rogel kept on and on. For many theorized that the Emperor gave something of himself to every one of his Primarchs, but, in my view, that denuded him of those emotions, these feelings. When Rogel went to find the broken body of his father, he knew he was alive, but only barely. And Rogel looked into the Emperor's one remaining eye and saw it. For I believe the reason that the Emperor of Mankind kept Rogel close was because of the very faith he had he believed in the Imperium so very much. He believed in the dream. So when the final word was to be received, when Horus was to send the greatest of all communications, the word that the Crusade had finally done what was thought impossible but seemed so probable, when the Emperor left his most able son in charge, the completion of the Crusade, the final message that stated Mankind is now safe. I believe, like a jaded old man, world-weary, 
and now incapable of experiencing joy, because he had given up so much of himself to his Primarchs, his sons. He had kept Rogel close, just so he could look into his eyes and see the joy contained therein. So the Emperor of Man could bask in his son's elation like a father at Christmas. Instead, the Emperor looked at the reflection of his broken body and saw that only Dawn stared at him. He witnessed the death of Rogel, and Dawn would have seen that reflected in his Our Father's eye as well. The pain passed back and forth, the loss unfathomable and magnified as they stared. The death of humanity was now certain. From the very jaws of salvation, defeat and extinction now loomed. Inevitable is the rising of the sun. The dark powers had won. No matter that Horus had been defeated, they had won. Yeah, um, the Chaos Gods have won. They have won this this war. Um, they've won in such a drastic and such unbelievable manner. They've won this battle. Uh, sure, their greatest champion, Horus Lupercal, has been erased, but he he has executed the plan. Um, he has caused a lot of damage in the Imperium. Uh, killing billions, destroying cities and planets and everything just to come all the way to Terra and also destroy uh, the capital of humanity. So definitely he is feeding the Chaos Gods all of the pain and suffering and all the ecstasy and the, the knowledge seeking and the death and the, you know, all the attributes or all the representatives of chaos demons they've been gorging on all of this energy that's been created by humanity during the civil war and definitely they've won um in terms of uh defeating the emperor and his sons they've won in uh, absorbing all of the warp energy that's emanating from the civil war and basically they've also won in um, uh, making the Imperium stagnant because they've destroyed the king who is like the body of the Imperium they have killed the, the mind which is Horus uh, they've killed the soul which is Sanguinius of the Imperium so definitely they've won big time big time really they've been planning this with such detail <laughs> the chaos demons well done I, I actually i must clap for them they, they've done they've done exceptionally well here so dawn brought his father back to terror and took down his final instructions his final plans but both knew they were but forestalling the end grasping for the path that would lead to the longest death rattle for humanity the Imperium and the Dream were dead. Dawn then placed his father in the machine known as the Golden Throne, the life-extending and power-magnifying alien object that would maintain him until the 41st millennium, 10,000 years later. And during this time, um, Malkidor, the Sigilite, this is where he dies, right? This is when he turns into ash and he's dead. And then they put the Emperor on the Golden Throne. Okay, I think that's this is where it happened. But never truly alive. Always teetering on the edge of death. Holding on for the sake of his race but never able to recover, 
repair or save his life and the hope he had for his people. Dawn found that his brothers had arrived, that the Blood Angels and his own sons had charged the enemy lines when the advent of the death of Horus was plain to the entire demonic and traitor hordes, that they had fled from the righteous wrath, and that the Blood Angels had felt, had felt their sire die. Dawn took his men, led his remaining brothers, on a crusade of wrath and of penitence. For though Rogel was gone, Dawn, the warrior, was ashamed. He was so guilty that he had fought so hard for so long that the very last had failed his rage was called, and he exacted butchery from the butchers, and chased them all to the edges of space, and then finally into the eye of terror over a campaign of years. When Dawn returned from his great campaign of vengeance, where he found that he had been supplanted, for not all evil is warp generated, not all wrongs are from without. The warp was only a reflection that collected and magnified the evil within the hearts and minds of those in the corporeal world. The amplification of jealousy. Reboot was left in charge of what was left of the broken Imperium. To give him his due, Reboot organized well and restructured and defended humanity, while Dawn and his brothers performed the scouring. But Reboot had elevated himself, had become enamoured of his own authority, with too long without anyone to gainsay him. So he supplanted Dawn, the man who had taken the last instructions from the Emperor before he ceased to speak, and gained such authority that to disagree with Reboot was seen as treason. Okay, alright, so Rebute Gilliman is... Uh, the second in command of the Imperium now. I'm, I'm, I'm still, uh, you know, trying to understand the power play with the Primarchs because now that Rebuta Gilliman is second in command, or should I say, he is the caretaker uh, of the Imperium. Does that mean that he has authority over the other Primarchs, or is their authority all level? Plain field, you know, are they all equal in terms of authority and jurisdiction? Um, because I've been really being, I've been confused about this for some time. Um, after watching some uh, videos um, related to the Imperial Fists, how they have a special command that can reorganize uh, their legion into one unit again. Because I remember that it was Gilliman and some other officials who decided that uh, the legions should separate into chapters. And um, uh, Rogaldorn has a special command. Uh, what was it called again? Last Wall Command. That um, commands his uh, chapters to unite into a legion again. And isn't that against the laws that... Um, Gilliman has set for the Imperium in terms of the uh, uh, the Astartes never to uh, join up into legions anymore. They should stay as chapters. So I'm, I'm still trying to figure out who has the last say in this situation. Um, so I, I'm thinking maybe it is Robute Gilliman because he is uh, the de facto uh, stand-in emperor for the Imperium. Because the the current emperor is incapacitated, he is uh, between half death and half life. You know, he is drifting uh, in and out of consciousness, out of out of consciousness. So he can't really dictate to his sons uh, on current situations. So yeah, it's it's complicated here. It's really complicated. Or maybe I'm making it complicated. I don't know. <laughs> 
when Reboot Gilliman produced his Codex Astartes, a document that stated that no man should ever command such power of a legion of Astartes again, and that all of the legions should be broken into units of only 1,000 men. The chapters. He stripped Dawn and his brothers of their only remaining reason, to take from them their very sons. Dawn declared he would not do it. Never. Naval ships, under the reason that Dawn had defied Reboot, actually fired on one of the Imperial Fist vessels. Dawn was facing compliance for another civil war, one that would hasten the expiration extinction of the human race. Dawn took himself into seclusion and used an item only known as the Pain Glove to inflict untold pain on his body so that he could meditate in peace. Dawn came out of that meditation with a simple decision. His sons would not be parted from him and would not bow to reboot Gilliman. So they had to be sacrificed. They had to undergo their own Pain Glove. They had to atone. They would go to a place, a trap, known only as the Iron Cage, which I will describe in more detail in the future, if I can gain the heart to do so. And there, in the trap laid by Perturabo of the Iron Warriors, specifically made to taunt Dawn, he attacked, knowing well that, like Abraham, he sacrificed his sons to death in the name of the Emperor, for Reboot would brook no challenge, and would not trust another Primarch to ever wield the power of a legion again. And so they died. Perhaps they would have all... Okay, Ro Rogel Dawn sacrificed his own sons because he didn't want them to be under the control or the leadership of Rebute Gilliman. All right. Um, yeah. He died if Gulliman had not led his marines, his ultramarines, to the site and intervened to save the last of them. The shame of it. But Dawn was a Primarch only now. He would not feel the shame that Rogel would have. Affronted, yes. The shame, no. For, in my reading of the lore, I suspect that Dawn took the sons of Rogel and allowed them to be slaughtered to see if there was anything of Rogel left. Any last vestige of the man who dreamed a dream of the future. If anything remained of Rogel, he would awaken then, or not at all. Dawn was satisfied. There was nothing left of him. Rogel was dead. Only Dawn remained. The legion remnants were then broken into the chapters of 1,000 men that Gulliman demanded. Some records say that only three chapters were possible, so few of the Imperial Fists that were left after the Iron Cage. The Imperial Fists were the first thousand, the Crimson Fists the second, and the Black Templars the last. Only I remember the Black Templars from uh, Hell's Reach, the movie. Yeah, I remember these guys. Three thousand sons of dawn from nearly a hundred thousand at the beginning of the heresy. Other reports state other things, but we shall go through them in a different time. Dawn went on to fight against the enemies of the Imperium, and it is said that he was ferocious, but without mercy or pity. For these were traits of Rogel, not Dawn, and Rogel Rogel, he was left on the bridge of the vengeful spirit, forever experiencing that longest second. Perhaps it is better this way. 
Dawn was said to have been killed on a traitor ship when they burst from the Eye of Terror, the warp, in one of their many raids into real space. There is con some contention over this from fans, however. The only thing that was left was his hand. Since then, his sons, the Imperial Fists, have kept it as a sacred keepsake, an icon left on the phalanx, his mighty vessel of war, and the Imperial Fists' home. Each chapter master has since then scrimgeored their name upon the very bones of the hand of Rogel Dawn. There are theories that this is not the case, and that Dawn may not be dead, and exists on terror in the palace hidden, watching over the husk that is the body of the Emperor of Mankind. I personally can think of no worse fate for this son, for this man. For if Rogel had truly lived, then he would have had to watch his dream, his dead dream, decay day by day, year by year, century by century, like a parent watching their child decay in front of them, and never being able to look away, never being able to gain one single moment of respite. This theory I cannot bear for the legend. The hero, the man who fought so hard for so long, and nearly, so very nearly, prevailed against half of his brothers, those demigods, practically single-handed. It is too grimdark even for me. So I hope Dawn did die on that vessel, fighting, despite the fact that it would have been suicide by chainsword by the hand of his enemy. For Dawn would never be killed by the likes of them. I hope this was all my heart. Um, yeah, maybe he just gave up, you know, he was tired of fighting and he allowed himself to be cut uh, by the enemy, like chopping off his hand um, and probably, yeah, it's like some sort of like an assisted suicide or something. I don't know. I don't know. Um, where Voldemort says that, you know, no mere demon could fail. Rogel Dawn. I, I'm not sure about that. We don't know. He might have been facing some sort of powerful uh, warp creature that, you know, is akin or maybe close enough to a chaos god uh, that attacked him and defeated him. Or something else happened. We don't know. Um, the part where he said that maybe Rogel, yeah, Rogel's spirit is. Um, in the vicinity of the emperor in the throne room you know watching over him uh probably that's happening too we don't know we don't know anything about spirit worlds and stuff like that um but probably his spirit is in the warp and you know he's watching over his father like that uh i don't know <laughs> i'm just i'm just making a lot of assumptions here and get and just guessing but i also want to believe that maybe he is dead um, like he fought his fight to the bitter end and it just wasn't enough and someone took his life. Hmm. I mean, these guys are not invincible. They can die, you know, they really can die. So, yeah, it can happen.
I had intended to leave the story there, as that is what is known and canon, as many say. And after eating, sleeping, dreaming this tale for so long, I was desolate. To do what I hope you agree is really get inside the shoes, the skin of Rogel. I had to bend my entire will to his existence, his experience, his perspective, his life, and his pain. My deepest woe was for a man, such a man as Rogel, to give up, to give in, to end the story defeated. This great titan who had endured so much. So desolate was I, I could not see how I could continue to do this if the byproduct was such emotional disruption. But then I read the comments section and was enlightened. So for one last time, Put your hand in mine, gentle listener, and let me take you on another journey. Let me tell you what this bard thinks has happened, or will, in the future. For I realized I was wrong in my reading. The story of the Warhammer world does indeed mutate and progress. Once, the idea that a Primarch would return was laughable. They were only background to add verve to the setting, but not so now. We have been told that they will all return in their own way, but comparatively soon. If this were the case, then how could this be managed? How could the Primarchs have been gone so long and done so little while all of this time had passed? Then I took the one word, just one word, from a fellow fan called Seladrin, Dina, and it all fell into place. The Corvus Corax went into the Eye of Terror. Jagatai went into the webway. Vulcan appears to defeat the beast, but then inexplicably disappears again. Russ goes into the warp, and the lion sleeps. So much I still believe is true, but Raboot has returned. Dawn is reported dead, only his hand remaining. But what if? Just what if Black Library and Games Workshop intend to tell a different story for a new century? They have mentioned Reboot having a round... We are desperate here, aren't we? <laughs> I like it, I like it, let's continue. <laughs> ...table. The king lies crippled and dying and awaits a cure. How very... Arthurian. What if Horus is not Satan, as some state? What if he is Mordred? What if Rogel was not Michael after all? What if he is Galahad? But what if Rogel is not dead? What if during the Pain Glove experience, his father contacted him and showed him he was not dead either, just crippled, as some state? What if Rogel still believes? Can anything stop this man when he believes? What if the master of mankind said Rogel, his Galahad, the only Primarch left he could trust with this task? A quest, a way out, a cure. What if Rogel spoke to his brothers what if they agreed that one of them had to remain to guard the Imperium? Reboot would be the choice, but he did not trust them. Perhaps they feared that he would try to stop them, liking his power and position too much to surrender it, even to its rightful lord. Perhaps that is unfair, and they just did not wish to burden him with their knowledge. 
Each of the Primarchs has gone into a separate realm, for even a deep sleep, as in the case with the Lion, can be said to be another realm as well, the Realm of Dreams. Vulcan, to return, just to save the Imperium, then vanish again, and in one of the most modern books, he has stated to a son of Dawn that he will tell his father about him. Did the brothers, led by one man, the man who spoke last with their father face to face, ask him to put down his quest just for a time, and when the danger of the beast was averted, to return to their number and quest again? What if Rogel led his brothers again as he once did, and they are the knights looking for the Grail? Utterly ungrimdark ghouls, may say, but why not? I never said they would succeed. For me, I like to think now that Rogel is still alive. Why not? Why not? Huh? Why not? What if? What if? Yes, let's let's make let's let let's do that brainstorming. Let's make sure that uh, we can give a somewhat of a happy ending to such a terrible situation. Uh, hey, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Not just dawn, and that Rogel is searching for that cure, that Grail that will rejuvenate the Emperor, and allow him to take his place on the throne once more to lead humanity and restore the dream of the Imperium. For I believe that there is only one person who could do this. Not a god, not a Primarch, but a man. A man who believes. Rogel. So in homage of this dream, I would ask that the battle cry of those players of the Imperial Fists, Black Templars and Crimson Fists, match my own. For if you believe, then do not shout his clan name. For it is the man, not the god, we should lord. Shout not for dawn. Reach for your paintbrushes. Reach for your glue. Reach for your dice and join me. If you believe, then echo my words. For humanity. For the Imperium. For their Emperor. But most of all, for Rogel. Yes, guys, that's it. That's the last act for Rogel Dawn Praetorian of Terror. Um, yeah, the the story had a very bitter ending, very sad ending. Um, Rogel Dawn comes to the uh, comes to the bridge of the vengeful spirit uh, and finds his brother Sanguinius dead on the floor. Uh, he sees. Horus Liprakau, you know, being erased from existence. He sees his father mutilated, you know, his arm is gone, his face has been melted, half of it gone, the eye, the eye is also gone. Um, he's very badly hurt, uh, his back is broken, uh, and in that one second he realizes that the Imperium uh, the dream that his father had for the Imperium is dead and all that's left now is a half alive half dead Emperor uh, ruling over a broken Empire that has that is still reeling from the civil war that was caused by uh, uh, the traitorous brothers the traitorous Primarchs and I'm not sure where they are exactly like Logar Angron, Conrad, Motarian, Botarabo, and Magnus. I'm not sure where they are um, during this battle between uh, Sanguinius, the Emperor, and uh, Horus. Um, I'm sure maybe they retreated after they realized that Horus was defeated. And yeah, it, it's quite sad. It's really sad. Um, and also, what happened to Jagatai? Why didn't he also go on the ship? He should have also been on the ship. 
like we they needed to have as many primarchs as possible on the vengeful spirit uh and since there's only three of them and the emperor really all four of them should have just went onto the ship and you know the more the merrier i say especially when dealing with someone so powerful as horus Lubrical. so definitely they should have brought more people aboard that ship um and where were the custodies because the custodies are meant to protect the emperor from all harm you know even if it comes from the emperor's children so where were they in all of this mess uh because rogel dawn had his own personal guard with him uh when he teleported onto the ship so i'm assuming the emperor also had his own personal guard sanguinius also had his own personal guard um, or maybe they wanted to fight in this honor code kind of situation where it's a one-on-one -on -one battle or something like that. I, I wouldn't do that. I would be like, guys, <laughs> everybody target your weapons on, on uh, Horus Lupercal and take him down. You know, there's no time for honor and battle one-on-one -on -one kind of situations. No, it's not about that. This is serious. We have to take him down. Um, but yeah. I digress. Uh, it, it is a good thing to think about what if scenarios, you know, after something so terrible like this. Because I remember uh, after watching Game of Thrones season 8 and how they treated uh, uh, Daenerys Targaryen at the end, like I was distraught, I was bitter, and I also started to imagine what if scenarios <laughs> in my head, you know. Um, and after what happened to the other dragons, you know, I just felt very sad and I, I, I had to find a way to soothe the pain. And this is a, mechan a mechanism of, you know, soothing that kind of pain, uh, to think about what if scenarios, think about, uh, any other ways that your favorite characters can come back and, and save the day again. So, yeah. The what if scenarios i agree with them wholeheartedly keep keep it up keep it up guys keep it up and yeah the the dream of the imperium of the emperor might be dead but i'm sure there'll be another dream coming up from either robute gilliman or any of the other primarchs um to make a brand new imperium so yeah it, it, it's sad what happened but since there's still more sons that survived, like Rubuta Gilliman, uh, like Re uh, Lehman Russ, and the Lion L. Johnson, and all the other Primarchs who are either lost in the warp or they're in the webway, which is quite odd. Why would Jagatai go to the webway? But, anyways, uh, probably I'll, f I'll figure that out as soon as I watch other videos uh, relating to him. But yeah, it's 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 sad. It's really really sad. And what happened to Rogel Dawn? Uh, him separating the Rogel part and all that's left is the Dawn part, and him killing his own men. That was just it's 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 crazy. It's just crazy. It's very very disappointing, you know. Uh, someone like him doing this to his own men. That's wrong. That's all wrong. And yeah, guys, I guess that's it. That's it for today with uh, Bellament uh, Guide to Warhammer 40k. Is it Warhammer 40k or is it just Warhammer? Yeah, <laughs> Guide to Warhammer. <laughs> um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed my reactions to Act 1, 2, and now 3. And if you like the video, please give me a like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Click on the notification bell if you need to be up to date with my latest videos. And I will see you next time with another installment from Warhammer 40k. Okay? Bye-bye.